Hi, welcome to the second video lecture on the definition of prejudice. This is where we concluded last time with the definition of prejudice from Allport. And you'll remember that prejudice is defined in terms of the cognitive, the emotional, affective, and the behavioral aspects of prejudice. It's got these two characteristics. The one feature of prejudice that is associated with a dislike or a hatred, and the second feature it is associated with irrationality, irrational behavior, irrational thoughts. People aren't really like that. Of course, in our everyday life, we don't see people spouting out and saying irrational and hateful things. Prejudice doesn't look like that in our ordinary lives, which begs the question of how does this theory tie in to our reality? And social psychologists have developed two factor models of prejudice to, to account for the, this discrepancy between this irrational and hateful nature of prejudice on the one hand and the fact that people don't behave or express prejudice like that on the other. And they basically make a distinction between the psychological genuine prejudice as this definition over here shows this is something that's developed in early childhood something that's deeply ingrained these are thoughts and feelings that are deep down they might even be unconscious they are things that we might feel uncomfortable about and yet they are ways that they are ideas and feelings that can arise quite automatically when we encounter people of different groups You'll notice in this definition of genuine prejudice that it's effectively negative. There's what all board called antipathy. There's the, the hate or the dislike. And it's not necessarily rational. It's not based on observation of what people are like. It's something that we've picked up through our history, through our socialization, through child rearing, and that we now uh, attain our perceptions and view of the world. The two-factor models make a distinction between this genuine prejudice on the one hand and then the motivation to suppress it. Of course, we can't go around in everyday life uh, uttering these prejudiced uh, thoughts and feelings. There are strong motivations and powerful pressures, uh, political correctness, called if you like, the image of yourself as a, as a liberal, as a tolerant, as not as a bigoted person series of values that uh, inform our society, support for underdogs that is almost universal, social norms and taboos against the expression of prejudice. So this, these two factor theories of prejudice, so on the one hand we've got this, this underlying genuine prejudice, but of course also there are these social forces to suppress the expression of this prejudice. There are a number of different theories of how this, these two-factor models of prejudice work. The first theory that's become common in the past 30 or 40 years is symbolic racism theory. This theory argues that people might know and might recognize they have uh, preferences for their own group. They might recognize that they have prejudices towards our group, but they only express these in ways that are politically correct in ways that can be framed in terms of cherished values. For example, race prejudice can be um, expressed not in di directly, but in beliefs about, for example, that uh, certain groups have got more than they really deserve. So that's a kind of belief that this group has got, is, has been unfairly treated, has got an advantage historically, um, they've done better than they deserve, which is a way in which prejudice can be expressed in socially acceptable form. A second theory of prejudice is aversive racism theory. This theory applies to people that might not even view themselves as prejudiced. They might view themselves as genuinely liberal, as genuinely anti-prejudiced, and yet deep underlying there in the unconscious, they, they still carry from, from, the, from culture and from the early childhood experiences, uh, prejudiced mental associations that they're not aware of, they're unconscious. And yet these can manifest as some sign of anxiety in, inter, in terms of interracial contact. And it can affect how people interact with each other and how they behave. And then another two-factor model of, uh, of prejudice is benevolent racism 
or sorry, benevolent sexism. This is beliefs that might on the surface look genuinely positive. Beliefs that uh, look if, like, for example, there's what's known as the women are wonderful effect. Men generally think women are wonderful. They think they're great, fragile, precious creatures to be looked after. So these views might look positive, but they, they mask uh, a sense or, or belief that, that women are incapable of looking after themselves and that they need a man to look after them. So these uh, benevolent sexism beliefs are ways, all three of these are ways in which these negative sentiments or these negative prejudices can be expressed or are expressed in socially acceptable ways that balance both this genuine prejudice on the one hand and the motivation to suppress it on the other. So in the rest of this lecture, we're going to consider two um, defining features of prejudice. This is the first we're going to look at the notion of irrationality. Is prejudice irrational? Well, Rupert Brown argues not necessarily. And he argues so for two reasons. The first, he says, that it's actually hard to determine what is true about social groups. And he actually he goes on to say it's impossible to determine what's true about social groups. Do social groups possess the traits that are stereotypically associated with those groups. And then the second uh, feature of this argument is that all groups tend to favor them, uh, th themselves. And I'll, I'll try and illustrate this with a, with a concrete example. Now, one of the most widespread stereotypes around race is the idea that black men especially are criminal. Now, is that, that's a stereotype, but is that true? Is it possible to, to say, yes, this is a, a fact about a race group or not? Well, take for example, someone who wants to prove will say, well, look here, let's go look at the prisons. You know, if, if black men are criminal, then we should go and find much more, a higher proportion of black men in prison than exist in the population. Now, this is where Rupert Brown's argument is, is very powerful. Is, does that provide evidence of the stereotype? We'll take a look at this, uh, the facts around cocaine use. If you take a look at the table down there, you'll see the two different kinds of cocaine. Cocaine can come in crack, which is rock form, or it can come in a powder form. The rock form is normally smoked and the powder form is normally snorted. Now, we have to understand that there's a, there's a race and class dynamic to the consumption of cocaine. It's main, mainly white, mainly wealthier people that consume powder cocaine. And in America, it's mainly black and mainly pure, poor people that consume rock cocaine. If you take a look at the table there, you'll see the, the mean um, amount of cocaine that people are arrested with. You'll see that people are normally arrested with much greater quantities of powder cocaine than with crack cocaine. And in the next column, you'll see the, the mandatory applicable sentence for that amount of cocaine. And you'll notice there's a huge unfairness or a slant. So 10 years for 52 grams of crack, but no jail term for 340 grams of powder cocaine. And so the, 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 the judicial system itself is so designed to, to police, to arrest, and to incarcerate African Americans, to incarcerate black people. That's why in the United States today, um, a black males, one third of them either have been in prison, are currently in prison, or will be in prison. So it's hard, to, as, as Rupert Brown saying in that first point, it's hard to determine what is true about uh, social groups. Are black people criminal or is the, the judicial system designed in such a way to incarcerate black people? Of course, it's very difficult to um, get outside of your own skin, outside of your body and outside of your race group to be able to make a fair and unbiased uh, decision. Or perception of this matter and that's the second point of there. So the, the general argument that Rupert Brown is making that it's very difficult to establish that race prejudice is actually irrational. The second defining feature of prejudice historically is is prejudice associated with disliking? Is prejudice associated with with hate even? 
Well, if you take a look at the the prejudice relations between gender, these they're not characterized between men and women in heterosexual relationships. At least, is often not characterized by by hate. It's characterized most often by love. The, in fact, the, the 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 opposite. And the fact that there is love there an attraction there doesn't mean that there isn't prejudice, stereotypes, patriarchal beliefs. The same is true in domestic labor as these pictures I've, I've shown you over, over here. There can be in domestic labor there's intimacy between um, employers and employees. They're both employers and employees often um, consider themselves liking or loving or, or being close to or being fond of their each other. So yes, we've got a system of deep inequality, a system where, where race stereotypes and race prejudice apply, but is not characterized by hate, dislike, antipathy. So in conclusion, for 80 years, social psychology has focused on prejudice. It's focused on the problem of prejudice, dislike, irrational beliefs that cause and underlie intergroup conflict uh, and problems between people. And we now at the time, sort of 80 years later, we social psychologists are beginning to think, is prejudice really the problem? Is the aim of social psychology to, to target prejudice, to reduce prejudice, or should we develop other aims? Especially since very often it's not negative beliefs, it's not irrational beliefs that are associated with inequalities in our society. Should social psychology move from prejudice reduction to social change? That's basically where we are in the social psychology of prejudice today. What we're going to do in the next set of lectures is to look at some of the psychological explanations uh, of prejudice. Thank you.